that invite you now um, to speak. Thank you much for the kind introduction, Usher, and thanks to all organizers for inviting us, at least spiritually. And uh, thanks, Chava, for a fascinating paper. Um, Essie, would you like to, to start? Yeah, I can start. So, listening to nature. What does it mean to listen to nature? There are many ways to understand the phrase. We could start by asking, what is nature? The notion of nature can be criticized for many good reasons, such as for privileging Western anthropocentrism by corroborating the distinction between the human and the non-human world. We do not wish to reinforce anthropocentrism, but rather to decenter it by a dialogical approach inspired by Martin Buber. We use the term nature as an umbrella term for the non-human natural environment, such as flora, fauna, and minerals. How about listening? Usually, we think of listening as something we do with our ears. Here, however, we understand broader terms. Let us start with uh, with a story about a very concrete instance of listening to nature. Claudia. And as soon as the pandemic allowed us to meet in person, we planned a few days retreat. So no, you didn't. And here in this idyllic landscape that you can see on the slide, um, with a lake, with meadows and forests, we went for walking talks, Essie and I, and on, you know, way with other, a bit better, but also encountered the creatures you can see on the picture. And upon passing by, I greeted them, and they looked up and listened to my whispered words. And I would have forgotten completely about this instance, about this brief episode, had Essie not reminded me of it later, when she invited me to co-author a little paper on the role of mythical stories in which animals appear as our friends. Help, help relations when letting us transcend the spheres of mundane life and enter into the world of the divine. Indeed, uh, mythical stories suggest a variety of responsive ways of relating to plants and animals. And there are also stories in the Bible where this is the case. Think, for instance, Balaam's donkey who saved his life, or the lilies and the birds in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in these biblical narratives, for instance, about the donkey, just as in folk myths, Animals can speak with words. They can direct themselves directly, verbally, to human beings and communicate with them in their own language. The grazing cows we met in Denmark, however, did not speak Danish or Finnish or English. <laughs> but nonetheless, there was this mutual attentiveness in that the grieving was somehow received and reciprocated in the form of looks, of heads being raised in terms towards us. The body language was telling, even though it's very difficult to know exactly what it told us. Due to this hermeneutical difficulty, we will now explore the strengths and limits of dialogue in relation to fauna and flora. We will do, do so with Mark Martin and of book I am down. Uber conceptualizes human existence through two pairs of words. The word pair I it denotes an objectifying stance towards the other. Quote, I perceive something, I feel something, I can imagine something, I want something, I think something. And this 
and it's like it's the base of the realm of it. Uh, by contrast, the word pair I now denotes a dialogical relationship where the you is no thing among things. When I say you to another being, I enter into a direct relationship to it with my whole being. Though Buber's concept of dialogue is most often applied to human relationships, Buber included plants and animals in the realm of possible dialogue partners. In his autobiographical reflections on domestic animals, we meet a cat and a horse. However, the most famous of Huber's reflections on nature is perhaps his description of a meeting with a tree. That is on the slide now. So, quote, I contemplate a tree. I can accept it as a picture, a rigid pillar in a flood of light or splashes of green traversed by the gentleness of the blue silver ground. I can assign it to species and observe it as an instance. Throughout uh, this, the tree remains my object. So in this quote, uh, there is the uh, uh, analytic scientific gaze at work, which detects the biological uh, qualities uh, of the tree Yet, however, Cooper also emphasizes its bodily presence, which is the presupposition for a personal embodied counter. So he continues that some uh, continues to argue that sometimes, however, and now we come to the dialogical encounter, it happens if will and grace are joined that as I contemplate the tree, I am drawn into a relation and the tree ceases to be an it. There is nothing I must not see in order to see. So I don't have to forget about or exclude the uh, qualities that the tree has. Yet, however, I can step uh, into or be drawn into a second person relationship with the tree in which the tree becomes the doll, a dialogical partner. The IU relation involves for Buber a special kind of dialogue. The tree's conversation in German Unterredung with the elements and the stars. The noun Unterredung contains the verb reden, that is to speak, and thus Buber seems to think that the tree somehow speaks to the earth and the wind, to the water and the light, and to listen or attend properly to its silent posture, the rustling of its leaves and the uniqueness of its presence. The dialogical relation Buber has in mind here cannot be reduced to a speech act. Rather, it is a relation that involves one's openness to and acceptance of the presence of the other. The tree is not only imagined, but also bodily present vis-a-vis -vis me. Er leibt mir gegenüber. And my relation to it is characterized by reciprocity, gegenseitigkeit, the mutuality implied in this co-presence means that both the tree and the person standing in front of it respond to each other's existence and embrace it as it were and of course i agree with uh, with you Chava, that the uh, reciprocity is not complete here um, when human beings have to deal with with a tree and other um, elements of nature that can't speak verbally so the tree and the person, they come close to each else, to one another. When a tree, for instance, provides shade uh, to the wanderer in the burning sun, this is a gift beyond any instrumentalizing purpose that a hiker might have when approaching the tree. Here, the tree is not only seen uh, 
as a thing that can be used as a means to an aim, for instance, a piece of wood for healing, but rather as a living being and fellow creature in the community of all that exists. It has power in the breath of the breath of life in every creature and the resonance or vibration of another's presence in me through which I am addressed in such a way that reciprocal relation or nearly reciprocal relation can, can be established between us. And once this happens, the tree can become a friend and the bird, a you, really, Uber's dialogical approach to what we today can call environmental ethics, climates in the insight that animals and plants are not only and not primarily material objects in our environment, but living beings who speak to us and deserve our response to their momentous temporal mortal presence in German, Gegenwart, as opposed to a Gegenstand, a thing standing over against us. Eco-philosophical or eco-theological reflections entail dialogues with trees, flowers, animals, and even stones can teach us how to listen to nature in the sense of developing a heightened awareness of its presence and to respond in wonder amazement and gratitude. In his book Zwiesprache, Uber identifies the basic movement of the life of dialogue, namely Hinwendung, one's turning towards the other, and this invokes a strong notion of human responsibility for creation. In fact, Uber derives the word Verantwortung, responsibility from responding, antworten, when claiming quote, genuine responsibility exists only where there is re real risk. And he clarifies that we shall respond not only to human voices, but also to the voices of all other creatures. There are, however, limits to dialogue. Yeah, and Bober tells us how he, as an 11-year-old boy, spent the summer on his grandparents' estate and used to steal into the stable and gently stroke the neck of his favorite horse, experiencing the near and touch it. And the horse would raise its head and then quietly as a conspirator gives a signal, given a signal to be recognizable only by his fellow conspirator, as he describes it. But once the boy became conscious of his hand and the stroking, and the next day, when he stroked his friend's head, he did not raise his head. And Buber tells this episode in order to explain the distinction between a movement turning upon it self lets the other exist only as a part of one's own experience and the wholehearted acceptance of another in his or her particularity. Being in dialogue does not mean that one appropriates the other and thus levels authority, but rather that one appreciates the other's incomparable presence, which remains beyond one's command. Passage with the horse also points to an other limit of dialogue. And we cannot dwell in dialogical eye-thou relationships forever. Mm -hmm. We cannot but oscillate between I eat and I thou relations. Quote, every you in the world is doomed by its nature to become a thing, or at least to enter into thinghood again and again. So we need an instra instrumental relationship to survive. Mm -hmm. Now, in relation to non-human nature, human beings' ability to listen, 
to its silent posture is required. But what exactly does this mean? In what ways does listening promote dialogues with and about nature? And how can such a listening stance and dialogical approach to nature contribute to environmental ethics in these times of climate change? Mm. Uh, I agree with you that listening captures well the mode of attention taking place in an eyebrow meeting. Yet, Buber himself uses visual metaphors uh, in the quotes above, where he describes the meeting with a tree. Quote, there is nothing that I must not see in order to see. Uh, so, why do we want to focus on listening? The dialogues with the plants and animals do not operate through words but remain below language. So what we need to listen to is silence. We need to listen with our eyes and our whole body. As the cars did not speak Danish, Finnish or English, we needed to listen to their silence. And Claudia, in your previous work, you have discussed voice and silence in prayer. You quote Jean-Luc Chrétien, who writes, quote, Nature must keep quiet so that silence might become voice, and so that in it, as in a treasured locket, the human voice might resound. I find this is a powerful idea and in tune with Cooper's thinking. Silence becomes a voice if we listen carefully and if we respond to that voice with our own voice, which does not have to be a sound. Sometimes an embodied presence is enough to create a dialogue. But I think there is even more to this. Sharing silence, we can learn to appreciate silence itself, not as a prerequisite for a voice, but as it is, silence. And this opens an avenue for another kind of decentering human. According to Buber, in and through silence, we can speak to God. Uber writes, and we speak to him only when all speech has his within. So, in the Buberian framework, embodied silent listening to nature can open up a pathway to the sacred. In addition, embodied listening to vibrations can reveal vitality that entangles us to our surroundings in new ways and opens up possible worlds not accessible through other means. So trying to close the circle, I would like to get back to the cows. As I watched Claudia conversing with the cows in Zambia, I was able to feel the responsiveness and the joy of this encounter. And I think this deeper uh, level experience that we shared in that moment, later facilitated uh, our cooperation. In a similar fashion, if we share imaginative practices and combine them with immersive experiences in nature, environmental education can become transformative and build up more sustainable worlds. Summarizing the strength and weaknesses or the strength and limits of a dialogical approach to nature, we can maintain firstly that it its strength lies in its emphasis on mutually responsive co-presence. The recognition of and responsibility for the non-human other who is involved in the second person relation. Secondly, as the breach in Buber's trustful relation to his darling, the horse, has shown, the limits of I thou encounters appear in their impermanence, ephemerality, and unavailable. And this points to the importance of continuous listening. Mm. Respect for our environment forbids us to just exploit it in the name of instrumental reason or 
utilitarian spec ra rationality. Hoover's biological approach to nature, which is rooted in the belief that human beings participate in God's unfinished project of creation, may instead lead us towards an ethic of things, as Asher Biman has called it, things that are cared for. And not just human beings, but also animals, plants, and inanimate geological formations can hence be viewed as a member or members of a cosmic community. We are called to protect due to the interdependency and interconnectedness of all its parts. And as one becomes an I through a you, expanding the realm of you to animals, plants, and even stones also expands our existential possibilities when co-imagining more sustainable ways of living. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, um, Claudia and Essie, for your beautiful and creative presentation. Can you hear me now? All right.